How are you doing today? Yeah, thanks for coming here. I'm so excited to be sharing some of my experience with you. And yesterday I talked to some of you and I was excited to find out that a lot of you, uh, while focusing on science and engineering, you also have a passion for art and design. And today I will be sharing with you some of my projects and how I can combine those two different fields together. So I work for Microsoft. I manage the garage in Silicon Valley. The garage is a very interesting place and I'm so fortunate to be working here. So yesterday I heard uh, Ahiri loving her job. I was so happy to hear another colleague commenting on that because I love my job too. So the garage is a platform for employee-led innovations. That means a lot. That means people with all kinds of ideas, they have a platform to come to, to work on their passion projects. It doesn't have to be their day job, it could be, or it could be just something that they love to do on the side. So the garage helps them to pursue their ideas. We can help them grow from an idea to a prototype and go all the way into the market. And by managing this uh, program in Silicon Valley, I got to work with all kinds of teams within Microsoft, and I work with universities, our ecosystem, the communities around us, other startups and companies. That's a lot of opportunities for both our employees and the company and myself. So as a employee in Microsoft, I also can manage and leverage the garage platform. This is a place that I can pursue different areas at the same time, from science to engineering to design and art. If you ask anyone who's working in industry, it's not very easy to be working in different disciplines. Usually you get to put into a box and then you work in that one thing until you retire. But hey, I got to work on those passion projects and uh, having a physics degree, uh, at the same time exploring integration of technology and design together. To give you some examples, this is a design that I did using a pattern matching engine. It tracks the hand motion and it has, a, uh, it has accelerometer and gyroscope, Bluetooth and the pattern matching engine all in the same chip. And I use the accelerometer to detect my hand motion. And I can train the chip to remember my gestures. So next time I wave my hand in the correct way, it will show the, the corresponding constellation on the dress. And this dress is also using my painting from my graphic novel. It has the scientist and her robot looking into the telescope. And in the sky area, I have the constellations. And I programmed four constellations like um, you're familiar with Cygna, Cassiopeia, Orion, and Big Dipper. To show you another example that I do in the garage is leading the education of quantum computing. This is using my background in physics. You heard a lot of news in the media about quantum computing, but rarely do people sit down and learn the math and physics to understand how it actually works. And I actually, even though I had a um, background in quantum physics, I actually didn't understand very much how quantum computing works. So I learned that and I thought there was a need to educate our employees. So we formed a uh, Silicon Valley quantum computing study group after our India garage formed that study group. And we educate our employees to get the basic concepts about the subject so that we know how this holistically works and learn how to program quantum computing because Microsoft has the Q-sharp language. Did I know that I would be doing all these? I had no idea. When I was a student, I just thought that I would become a scientist and I would live happily ever after. But life is much more complex. 
and is difficult. At the same time, there are surprises and there are a lot of opportunities. I would go back a little bit to talk about my past experiences growing up as a scientist. So I would say that I own everything that I know now to my education in physics. I really appreciate what I learned. Physics is a subject about the universe and nature. Understanding that helps us understand how the world works, including humanity. It gives us the tool to understand the complex events that happens in the world and appreciate humanity at the same time. I was born in northern part of China, and when I was very little, our family moved to Hong Kong. And I had a lot of influence. I, I read a lot about science. I was so inspired as a kid to do science. I wanted to do astronomy and later particle physics. But then I fell in love with condensed matter physics through practice. So my, the beginning of my professional career started from Cambridge University. That's my beautiful college, Gangwon Lan Keys. Since the first year of my undergraduate study, I started working in the Cavendish lab. I work in the group called Quantum Matter Group. And there we were studying the fundamental properties of materials. We had to cool things down to sub-Kelvin. That is a dilution refrigerator that I painted. So if you are in condensed matter, you understand that is a powerful fridge that would cool things down first to 4K and then lower it further to below sub-millikelvin. And that is actually what people are using to build quantum computers nowadays. You can't live without that. I learned a lot of skills working in the machine shop because all those things are most cutting edge research. We had to build a lot of the machine parts ourselves. So I grew up there as a young scientist, learned all kinds of different skills. But I wanted to do more applied uh, applications of the skills that I learned. So I moved on from fundamental physics to applied physics in Harvard University. So there I got experience working in the clean room. So my lab invented this new types of device that uses plasmonic waves. So plasmonic waves are waves that are generated in electron systems. You can confine electron in two dimension. Because of the dimensionality, it gives special properties to the waves that's generated in the electron systems. So we could make use of that and fabricate the chips to guide the waves to propagate. And it can manipulate the wave as you put different structures on the chip. We were able to make components that are 100,000 times smaller than their electromagnetic counterparts at the same frequency. That was proof of concept. To grow something from an idea in the lab to something applicable in the industry, it usually takes 10 to 20 years with hundreds of engineers working together. So we published a lot of papers. That was very interesting work. The skills that I learned was actually Im immediately applicable to silicon photonics. So I was very lucky to get into Intel to work on silicon photonics. It's very similar to plasmonics, except that is instead of plasmonic waves, is uh, light waves. So you can confine photons, light, onto the chip in the same way, and you put different structures to manipulate light on the chip. Where this is used has been in infrastructure data centers. So between servers, the servers we don't touch, but we use them every day through our computers, our, our phones, whenever we connect to the internet, we use data center. And in data center, there are a lot of 
servers that you need communication. The communication is established through optical fibers. Between the optical fiber and the servers, you need interconnects that can convert electrical signal with light signal. So that's what we made. That's the silicon photonic interconnects for data centers. So there I really learned how things could scale from lab. If you generate a great idea, you really have to work with all kinds of groups to integrate your ideas together and produce products. I thought that I would probably be working in this industry for a long time until I stumbled upon something really interesting. Are you guys familiar with open source hardware like Arduino, like the program boards? Yeah, you can, you can plug into your computer, write a code, and connect sensors, and uh, displays, all kinds of electronics onto the microcontroller. And you can have the microcontroller um, do whatever you want it to do. You can build robots, you can build IoT devices, or um, drones, or AR, VR systems. So Intel at that time was working on several modules that goes onto the microcontrollers, the, the boards. They're kind of mini computers and uh, microcontroller modules called Curie and Jewel. And when I got my hands on those things, I just couldn't stop making all kinds of crazy creations. So I was very lucky to join that maker group that were developing these open source hardware. I had a lot of fun. I actually um, formed an internal startup with my friends and colleagues. We made a health and safety device that we won some competitions and we filed a patent. And we were able to use our Intel technology architecture to build something that we can use every day. And I also had fun doing fashion design, putting electronics into my dresses. This one's using the accelerometer again. It detects your arm location, and it will change the color of the optical fiber. And I also made other kinds of wearables, like glasses. These two glasses can communicate through Bluetooth. So they're synced to flip from transparent and opaque at the same time. So imagine you are wearing one of these glasses, and on the road you see a stranger wearing similar glasses. Oh, we have the same fashion sense. Mm, maybe if my heart rate matches with yours, we'll check each other out. So this is like a physical Tinder. And, <laughs> and this project, I also want to explore the human-human interaction assisted by technology. So instead of human-computer interaction, I want to see how technology can help human interact better. It's like if you have a dog, you see someone have a dog, the dog will communicate, oh, you, you, you should communicate too. <laughs> I also made things like um, dresses that is controlled with the head signal. Your brain signal intensity can control the color and pattern on the dress through Wi-Fi. And that's actually an earlier iteration. I'm wearing the, the third iteration of the design. It's a painting of the Earth. I call it the chaotic Earth in the peaceful universe. And that's from my graphic novel as well. You can also make um, mechanical movements. This one's like uh, winged and some randomly blinking LEDs to uh, simulate the fall the falling leaves, and 3D dandelions, because my painting was painting a uh, dandelion. This one is a painting of uh, Jupiter. You can have the storm rotate by rotating the uh, satellite aisle of Jupiter. These are actually backstage videos of San Francisco Fashion Week I participated in 2016. So I had 12 designs, all with my paintings on them. Half of them were using technology. The other half were multi-way. 
So that was really fun being a designer uh, outside of work, uh, but using tech all kinds of different technologies, microcontroller, to control the effects of the clothing. The theme of that show was called Tech Drives Fashion. And I think tech is really the future of fashion. That's where we should be going. However, my happiness didn't last too long. <laughs> the products at Intel got cut. And that actually happens. Uh, if you work in a company, sometimes the decisions are made. Sometimes it doesn't uh, match with your expectation and where you think things should go. So I went back to Silicon Photonics. I could do my job very well, and it's useful work. But then I realized something. Take a look at this chart. Where do you see you are on this chart? Perhaps if you're a student, there's, there's still a lot of room to explore. But if you already work in industry, you probably find um, a position that could de describe where you are. So I was kind of there, a little bit below Ikigai. So I was doing something that the world needs. And I could be paid for that. And I was good at it. But there was something missing. I felt like I was only using half of my brain, not the other half. And I realized that I'm probably destined to do, to integrate art and science. It's probably what I should be focusing the rest of my life on. So I realized that products can be cut. Groups can be reorged. But no one can stop me from pursuing what I love to do. So I kept on doing, kept on creating weird stuff and interesting technology applications. And I got a lot of support from the maker community. My work was noticed, and they were published. I also explored other types of applications, like putting 3D printing into the dress. 3D printing can be described as one of the most mature new technologies that were just developed a few years ago. And now it's very accessible. Anyone can use it. Anyone can build stuff out of it. And I wanted to explore how I can integrate that into something I can wear every day. It's not just an art piece to show once, but I can actually wear it. So you can create a model. Um, software like Fusion 360 or SolidWorks. And you can send it to a service like um, the uh, Shapeways and get them shipped. Or you can just print it out using your home, home 3D printer. So that was actually a lot of manual work. I was trying to figure out the process, how I can scale this and have this reproducible. And the other way to contribute back to the society is to make those projects available. Everyone can look up on open source platforms and learn how other people did their projects and how you can make something that you want to build. So I learned a lot from the maker community. I learned a lot from other people's projects. So I wanted to contribute back. So I wrote up these uh, tutorials to teach people how these can be done. Not until long, I was uh, noticed by the garage in Microsoft. I was very lucky, because what I was exploring and doing matched exactly with how a garage wants to promote employee in innovations. So this was one of my new builds in the garage. It uses a solar panel and can charge your phone as you walk outside. Uh, Actually, if you look for the existing solar-powered jackets, they're usually vertical. But in order to get enough sunlight, you need this angle. So I thought that would look ridiculous. But I may as well make it avant-garde. So <laughs> I designed this uh, uh, holder that's like a backpack. The pattern is based on the pattern on the fabric. So this is to, sh to show that sometimes the hardware is not designed for fashion. But with clever fashion design, you can actually integrate into your work. 
the and opportunities opened up. People were giving me their uh, hardware and people sending me their materials. This one was from my friend working at SATI Institute. He has a company called Made of Mars and they use this material from volcanic rocks to build daily device, daily um, appliances um, and products. So he gave the material to me as a uh, design challenge. Can you make something fashionable out of these uh, fabrics? So these fabrics are made out of volcanic rock put into, um, th those rocks are put into fibers and the fibers are weaved into fabrics. And the composition of these materials is actually the same as on Mars. So that's why it's called made on, of Mars because if we ever want to go to Mars and have a colony, we need to know how to build things out of these materials. So once we get there, we, we know how to construct. So including daily uh, products. So I took this as a, as a challenge. At the same time, I was thinking, why and when do we even want to go to Mars? Earth is perfectly fine. <laughs> but is it because um, in the future, the Earth, the environment is too bad for people to live in? Um, so I wanted to make it also a warning for people on Earth right now that um, I put a optical sensor. Um, it can dust sensor. It can sense the air quality. And inside, there's a... Um, either fruit circuit playground that has uh, LEDs and temperature sensor so and buzzer. So I combine those and use the optical sensor to sense air quality and they can trigger a buzz um, in the sound to warn people when something goes wrong. And also the colors would reflect on the temperature. So this is a concept to warn people about global warming and air pollution. This is my latest build using my painting of flowers and the Arduino Nano to detect heart rate and the LEDs will blink according to heart rate. You can see the uh, EKG over there. So this one I wanted to show that we have uh, fitness stuff. We have tracker fitness watches and uh, some, some are using glasses or footwear. Those are hard materials. I wanted to build them into soft materials, into daily wear. And I also want to show people we don't have to differentiate functionality from aesthetic, aesthetics. Uh, we want both. We, we could have a beautiful dress that has functionality in it. It doesn't have to be just in fitness clothes. So what I learned in school were really helpful as a student. I learned uh, the skills and the understandings, but there are things that I learned during my work in industry. First thing is that I found out that sometimes those established environments are not very helpful for people with interdisciplinary interests. If you have an idea that that's maybe uh, aligned to another group, if the environment doesn't support you to pursue that idea, you don't feel fulfilled. If you're confined in a box, it's really difficult to grow. The environment needs to foster such innovative ideas. It needs to encourage people to grow in all kinds of directions. And I, as an older generation of millennial, I can relate to you, a lot of you are very creative and interdisciplinary. And the established industry need to build environments for the next generations of talents to grow in many directions and to do what they love to do. The other thing I realized was scaling. Having a good idea isn't the same as you can produce many products that more people can benefit from. I made this design for Intel two years ago that would use some um, wearable robot and fabric, uh, circuit on fabric. I could build it by hand, but if we wanted to scale it, it would cost $100 per t-shirt. 
that's not acceptable. I found out that the industry is actually not ready to scale those ideas to, to help designers pursue their designs. Th this problem has went on and on for decades, actually. Creative designers, they can build things by hand. They can make a high fashion or, or tattoo and uh, things that they can just make in their studio, but they rely on manufacturers to produce them, to make the process uh, reproducible. However, a lot of manufacturers do not want to do it until they see the market. They need to see demand from mass population. But people would not know what they want until they, some, they see something, some product that's already in the market. <laughs> so this is a negative cycle that's been going on for a long time. And the, it actually derives a lot of problems in the fashion industry. The main thing is that fashion design actually likes tools. From my experience in doing science and art, I can understand that tools really can advance different kinds of art. Instruments help musicians to express their feelings. The invention of the modern piano really helped Beethoven write a new genre of music. And digital art can help us print our creation onto any surfaces. I was able to make all the paintings on my computer so that I could print onto all kinds of fabrics later made into designs. And the existence of 3D printing and the software for 3D printing allow people to create all kinds of tools without going into sculpture. So I started thinking, why can't we build clothing the same way as building electronics? If you look at the two processes, they actually have very similar parallel steps. We start with 2D designs of what the material would look like. We, when we make chips, we draw those um, schematics, the diagrams that would tell uh, which layer is what material, how do you layer them up. You send the file to a clean room, to a, a foundry, and there are some engineers helping you, but mostly is automatic, is driven by the design. And then uh, the things get manufactured onto chips, you cut it onto wafers, you cut the wafer into chips, put them onto PCB. Again, the PCB is designed with file, and then you package it with a case. The case is again designed with a file. However, in fashion design, you can't drive the production with with files, with, with 2D graphics. We do start with a pattern, but then you send the pattern to a pattern maker, they go back and forth many times. The first time the fit is wrong, the second time the fabric is wrong because they don't use the, the right fabric first and the fit you have to, to change. And then eventually um, fit and fabric are correct. The, uh, uh, the notions are missing, the buttons are missing and the details are wrong. And that's the actually, Fashion industry has been going on for hundreds of years using the same process, and they are still making mistakes that could be avoided. If we drive the production using the same methodology as engineering production, that could make the whole supply chain so much more efficient. And there's actually a much bigger problem. Once you can, you can figure out the development, you send it to the manufacturer, Fasher, people working in terrible conditions, and then they produce tons, thousands of repeated units that lack design. They are just like that, the things that are so uncreative, no one wants to buy, and they are being sold in, in shops that are going down, discount, discount, discount. Eventually, they still cannot sell them. You guess what? They burn them, and that creates so much pollution in our planet. The whole thing is run in a really backward way. We should actually avoid those. If we use engineering into the same production cycle, that would solve a lot of problems. And right now, this industry has many challenges, but at the same time, opportunities. The research, we need better materials, a smaller battery, flexible battery. But eventually, after we have the technology, we need to make them available 
for people. Open source helped democratize technology. That's how I was able to learn how to program electronics and put them into the project I wanted to do, and anyone can. And with the creativity of people using open source, they can build things that are both functional and aesthetic. And we need to educate more people about the technology, about what you can do. Educate people who are younger like you, educate manufacturers, educate the market. Anything, anytime you do something that's not done before, you have to convince more people. But eventually, these, these communities are working quite closely together. But what's lacking is the manufacturing, the creativity-driven and need-driven manufacturing. That's what we're lacking. And that's what I found through my interest of things that I like to do by hand. I found this deep hole in this industry. So that's what I want to work on and help out. There are many, many solutions that we can do. And there are actually a lot of technology already ex exist, like the 3D scanning, um, like some of the machines can be automated. There's computer vision. You can take a photograph of someone's outfit. But then what it's been doing is like telling you uh, something similar you can buy. But what if you can turn that into something you can produce? If I take a picture of you, and then it figures out the pattern, it sends to the machine, automatically cut and sew, and produce the, the dress for you. That's what I want to see, how technology can integrate together to help the whole ecosystem and produce made to order to reduce waste. We should be only buying, we should be only producing things when someone already wants to buy them. We shouldn't be producing mass amount of wasted goods eventually we cannot get rid of. We should be only producing fashion designs that people already show their interest that in. They actually already made an order. People, you can make the technology as a platform allowing people to choose what kind of combination of the outfit you want and producing things that's personal. So this is something that I could be pursuing in the garage. It's a very valuable platform and environment. I wouldn't be able to do maybe in a different place. So what worked out for me is that I focus on science. I focus on engineering. And then my other interests I could be doing on the side. And by doing what I love to do, I was able to find a deeper gap in the industry. And then I can go further down. And also, combining creativity and technicality, sometimes people sometimes think that's two separate things. But really, science and art, to me, they're actually the same. They use the same methodology. They're doing things no one has done before. They're exploring the cutting edge. And science influences engineering. Through engineering, we can create things that will help with people's daily lives. Through art, we can influence design. And that's how we influence people intellectually and culturally. And at the intersection between design and engineering, that's where we can create interesting products. We can open up technology for anyone to pursue their creativity. And also as a woman, there are a lot of hurdles in our career and life. I think that we should be able to pursue both career and family at the same time. I don't think those two should be, should be either or. We deserve to have both career and a family and to stay with our loved ones. And beyond Korea, it's also important to realize what we are doing is contributing intellectually to the society. If we look back into history, it's always the intellectual value that gets distilled and passed down generations. We always picked up the best things from the past. 
So if we look back as a historian in the future, that would be the same. The things that we generate nowadays, every day, on social media, on any platform, it needs to be intellectual and it has to contribute certain knowledge and value and keep our humanity going. I sometimes would step out as an alien looking down in, onto Earth to understand the, the beautiful and the ugly of our society. When we are in our 20s, sometimes we uh, explore a lot. We uh, look at all kinds of opportunities and different paths in front of us. And in our 30s, we learn how to focus, how to narrow down, and finding a vertical that we want to spend the rest of our lives in. But sometimes in the 40s, some people become the world's most famous bigots. <laughs> but, and some of us, uh, some, of, uh, some people would regret that they haven't become the world's most famous bigots. But I really see that in this room and most of the people, I really hope that we can stay, we can keep our integrity and stay true to ourselves. There's been a continuous theme from, through yesterday's discussions that we should be humble and grateful no matter where we are. We can always look back and deep down into our hearts and find a child in ourselves. Thank you for hearing my story.